without him, you know, none of this would be possible. I probably wouldn't be talking to you guys still. Um, you guys probably wouldn't be looking at me, uh, you know, as the leader on this team. And, and you know, he put me in that position to be successful, and, and I can thank I can't thank him enough for that. Oh, he just just told us straight up that he wasn't going to be our coach for the rest of the year, you know. And uh, it's pretty shocking, you know. Nobody nobody in the room expected that to happen, you know. I just. I, I honestly thought like maybe some other changes could be happening. I didn't think anybody was gonna like leave, you know. So it's just, it's just crazy to see that just unfold. He's he's a great mentor. That's one thing. Again, um, I never say uh, anything different. He's a great mentor. He's a great leader, and uh, uh, he's missed. Wild week in Corvallis as Gary Anderson stepped aside as head coach of the Oregon State football program on Monday. According to Oregon State, the decision was mutual. They released each other from all future contract obligations, meaning a lot of money still left on the table by Gary Anderson. Corey Hall, now the interim head coach of the Beavers. Welcome into Talking Beavers. Amanda Maynard, Evanson Bernard, Nigel Burton. Uh, this one coming as quite a shock to just about everybody. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Blown away. Uh, blown away. Had an email early in the day. Uh, we had a uh, our, our team had a meeting at Gill, obviously that's where my office is, and they said, hey, we had a meeting around 11.20. I'm like, all right, whatever. Uh, it's nothing major. And then, you know, probably two minutes into it, you know, he goes, hey, you know, Gary's out. Um, just a heads up, you know, reach out to these donors, reach out to some former players, let them know. Uh, so, yeah, it was just shocking. You never see, like, especially mid-season, right? Yeah. Nigel? Uh, yeah, I was leaving our radio show there at iHeart and got an email. Um, from the conference basically saying, hey, look, uh, Gary Anderson out at, at Oregon State. And I was, I, mean, I was stunned. I actually had to stop in the stairwell and some lady was passing by me. I was, excuse me, because I'm about to fall over real quick. Uh, and I thought it was some hashtag fake news. I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, but it was, it was absolutely shocking when you think about everything that Coach Anderson stood for and, and what the program's about, uh, living in the heart and, and all those things. And then, um, you know, for him to be gone, I, I thought it was, uh, uh, and that, that it was mutual. You kind of assume that it was uh, something that was pushed by the university. Um, but upon learning about giving up the $12 million and the way the press conference went, you kind of found that actually it probably was sparked by him. Well, here's Athletic Director Scott Barnes on the news. This, uh, as we said, this was a mutual agreement, and it, it, it evolved. And, and uh, we've had conversations uh, for a period of time um, about a number of things, and, and so that conversation evolved. Scott, you emphasized that it was a mutual decision. Is anything wrong with Gary medically, with his family? No. Uh, to follow up on Scott, so you're saying there was nothing else going on. There was no situation where you were going to have a reason to fire him for cause? No. Quick fix, a look at Anderson's tenure at Oregon State. The Beavers won in five this season. He's gone seven and 23 during his three seasons with the school. Uh, Nigel, uh, speaking from a, you know, a coach, a former head coach, can you speak to some of the, the, the mental strains that you go through during a season? <laughs> uh, mental, physical, <laughs> emotional. Um, look, even when we were winning, I, I was joking with Evanson before, when we were winning, I mean, I couldn't wait for the Civil War. Not necessarily because, man, we get to play the Ducks. It was like, I get to sleep. Uh, I'm serious. I mean, you, you would be up. I, I know Coach Anderson was up at 5 o'clock in the morning because I would get texts from him sometimes as I was heading to my radio show and he was getting up and getting ready to go. And, and he would send me a text sometimes at 11 o'clock at night. So I know that you're talking about 16, 18-hour days, uh, seven days a week for seven months. It does not stop. There are no days off. You're working Sundays. You're working Saturdays. You're on planes. The supposed bye weekends, you're traveling to go see your recruit. Sure, I sure. mean, there, there's, it never stops. And so um, it can take a toll. And look, and listening to everything that I heard around campus, uh, Coach Anderson had lost 25 pounds this year. That's something that, you know, he had already lost weight from uh, the time I remember running into him uh, this spring and we were talking about workout plans. To lose another 25 um, tells me that he may not necessarily have some form of a, 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 a you know, a debilitating disease or anything, but the stress level had gotten him to a point that his body was telling him something, you can't sustain this. The school's seen quite a bit of turnover over the past few years. I mean, three athletic directors over the last few years, three offensive coordinators since 2014, three defensive coordinators since 2012. Evanson, what kind of toll does that take? 
Uh, it's tough, you know, um, for the players, not only for the players, but the administration going through all those changes and stuff like that. It's tough, you know, you try to find your identity. I think Oregon State's one of those schools that we always had an identity, right? You know, with Erickson era, with Riley era, we all, it was long and you knew everybody, it felt like family. And then you have this turmoil, the switching, the, you know, the continued, it's, it's just crazy to see, you know, where we're at right now. But obviously we're gonna bounce back. That's what we do. Um, and we're gonna find the right guy. How challenging is a move like this mid-season for coaching staff, players? I, I mean, it's, uh, I had to let go of a coordinator one time mid-season, and it's, it's unbelievable. They're trying to figure out, okay, now who's going to do this job that this one guy did, let alone the head coach sure. who wore so many hats uh, and has to deal with, you know, I talked to Corey Hall. I got a chance to visit with him yesterday, and uh, we talked about everything from, you know, who meets with the equipment staff, who meets with the trainers every day, who's going to meet with, and it's like, wait, he did this and this and this and this, and then I've still got to go coach the corners, and then who's going to come up with the practice plan? Are we doing blitz pickup today? So, I mean, it is a ton and when you look at the schedule um, that they have coming up this the you know when you got Colorado you still got to deal with uh, Stanford and then the rest of the of the year I mean the, the challenge is daunting what do you feel like is, is a realist realistic expectation for this group now provided this new set of challenges because prior to this the whole Gary Anderson thing we were like okay they're moving into a part of the schedule that maybe they could pick up some wins yeah, yeah. Can, can I address that real quick because here's the thing I didn't I've never understood when you looked at this schedule going into this season, and if you're a diehard Beaver fan or maybe a donor who gave a lot of money, I'm curious, what were your expectations? When you saw Washington, Washington <laughs> State, USC, See? the defending South champs Colorado, Stanford, all in a row, and then you still had Minnesota right before them, and granted you had Portland State and you had Colorado State, did people expect five and one? Because, right. I mean, it, it's like, and you can tell me about style points all you want to, but the fact of the matter is, you know, in most of those games, they were in it for half or three quarters. And and I, yeah. I don't understand when I hear all of the all the moaning that I was hearing coming out of, uh, out of Beaver, Beaver Nation. Yeah, I think with the last two games, right, Arizona and Oregon, you get those two victories. They're, they're excited, right? And we haven't beat Oregon in a while, probably seven years or something like that. So the, I think the excitement level was so high because of that. And then you go into the, you know, off season. We're practicing well. We're getting all these recruits. Um, I think, yeah. So I think that's why they had the excitement level. Pac-12 North, hard to win in there. All right, still to come, the bees trying to prepare for Colorado this week amidst all these distractions. And up next, a closer look at the man in charge, Corey Hall. Corey Hall tossed into the spotlight this week after being named the interim head coach of the men's of, of the football program. We got up with Hall after overseeing his first practice this week. Um, I think it went well. You know, a lot of energy out there. Um, the boys, you know, just getting their feedback throughout practice. They, they kind of, they, they, they love the energy, right? And they, uh, I'm, I'm proud of them because they came out here and they worked hard. Um, and they're focused, you know, they're focused. They're doing everything that we've asked them to do as a staff and couldn't be more proud. Again, I, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, what, what they're doing it for, who they're doing it for. You, um, you know what, the walkthrough last night, it was, it was at first, you know, kind of somber, you know, but again, it, it finished on a high note, you know, and today we started on a high note and we finished on a high note. So um, the, they are responding well. I'm, I'm proud of the boys. I really am. Background in our best foot forward brought to you by the Good Feet Store. He's been at Oregon State since 2016, coaching the cornerbacks. Prior to that, he joined Gary Anderson's staff in 2014 in Wisconsin for a season at Weber State in 2015. Also played in the NFL for six seasons. What do you guys think about this choice? I like it. You know, I think he's one of those guys that's going to motivate the players, right? At this point, we want to motivate our players, keep moving forward, keep the excitement level high, or get the excitement level high. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I think he's the right guy and he's a player's coach. Um, a lot of the players love him and I think he's a, I, obviously with our, our issues at the coordinator position and stuff like that, I think it's the right way to go. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, you look at the guys who've been the most successful stepping in as interim head coaches. Uh, who were they? Who's probably the most successful guy you could think of? Probably Ed Ogeron. Right. right. Like Ed, Ed Ogeron was the defensive line coach at USC, brings them back, almost gets the job, then does the same thing at LSU and actually gets the job. And I think the main reason is because as the corners coach, he has to worry about the corners 
as opposed to if you had named an, a coordinator, and let's be honest, they're struggling right now offensively and defensively. So you want to add that as a responsibility to a group of guys who they're already struggling with their responsibilities as is, I think would be a recipe for disaster. So you've got a guy who knows the system, has churned out NFL athletes, you know, knows what he's doing. And more than that, when you sit down and you talk to him, uh, it takes about two minutes for you to realize his charisma. He's got a plan. He's been a head coach before. Now, granted, it was high school, but coming from Sacramento the Valley, <laughs> Sacramento Valley high school football is like Texas high school football. It is serious. The, the town shut down. You better be there or you're ostracized. I mean, and so it's a big time feel to it. And so, um, you know, I, I look at all those factors and I think it was a great choice uh, uh, for him to be the head football coach right now. And so you don't think it's out of the question. I know obviously results are going to matter, but you don't think it's out of the question that he might be in the conversation for this coaching position? I think it's all result oriented. I mean, if, if somehow he were to rip off the last four in a row, which are all <laughs> winnable games, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they'll have to play really well, uh, and, and, and probably against some guy, better athletes than they have right now at Oregon State, that would tell you his coaching prowess, his ability to motivate players to be better than they really are. Why would you then look outside and say, okay, well, who can come in and get guys to play better than they already are? And it, once again, you spend two minutes with a guy. All I know is this, I sat down in his office, we talked, and uh, the first thing that dawned on me, I was like, I can imagine this dude in a living room with a set of parents and an 18-year-old kid, <laughs> I would hate to be the coach who has to go in after him because he's got that kind of yeah. beat about him, that kind of energy, that kind of commitment, um, and knows what he's talking about. And he can play the, hey, look, I've helped Thomas Deku get to the NFL. I've helped these guys go on. So if he's successful, absolutely, I would hope that he would have the opportunity to get the yeah. job. It's funny you say something about the charisma part. Uh, we had a golf event for our football team. Um, and I just remember him being around donors and other former players and the excitement level was so high. And then you look at the time and it's nine, eight, nine in the morning, he's running around the golf course, he's right. jumping around. I just, I love that about him. And I think it's a, it's a great pick. We're gonna, you know, I think, you know, just from that, the, just that personality that he has, uh, it's gonna take us uh, far. Yeah, ultimately, who's gonna be the guy that through this painful process can get these guys to be excited about football again, have fun with football again, and be willing to show their love for each other through their play, mm -hmm. who's better than Corey Hall right. exactly. on that staff right now? Obviously, charisma is very important when you're looking at head coaches. What do you feel like this program needs moving forward? What should the, the committee be looking for when they start this process? Uh, you know, a guy that wants to stay in Corvallis, <laughs> right? A guy <laughs> that doesn't want to use Oregon State as a stepping stone. Um, I think a little bit of Oregon State DNA will definitely help. Uh, obviously, with your fan base, your donors, um, and, and, and players as well. I think that's good. They know, oh, this guy played at Oregon State or coached at Oregon State, but he just has to have an Oregon State DNA, in my opinion. That's just me. Bro, I love you, and you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> but here's the deal. Um, you want somebody who's going to be so good that there's going to be a question of will he leave? That's what you want. You want somebody who's winning 9, 10, 11 games, putting you, what Coach Riley did, that all of a sudden, oh, man, can we hang on to this guy? You don't want somebody who's like, wow, I guess we don't got to worry about him going no anywhere. Like, I, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> I want somebody who's going to win so many games that we're constantly looking at, geez, like, I remember being with Lee Hull in the Phoenix airport going, Mike Riley interviewing at Arizona State going like, wait, what? You know, I mean, yeah. that's what you want because that means you're being successful. Right. And if you look at the two most uh, successful coaches outside of DeAndros at Oregon State, Dennis Erickson, Mike Riley, both of them former NFL head coaches, both of them had name cachet, yeah. both of them had recruits who were in LA who if it was between them and say Washington State, Colorado, whoever, that they were like, hey, I'm the former NFL head coach. You come here, you have a chance. Something that gets those guys to go, you know what? Yeah, these guys are pretty good, but man, you see what they're doing in Corvallis? Right. As opposed to some, you know, guy who, yeah, you know, he... he no, I think, but I also, I say that, but I'm saying those guys are going to want to... Those guys are going to get pulled from other schools, but they wouldn't want to stay. All That's right, my... more discussion to come on this topic. Later on, we're one step closer to crowning the best football player in Oregon State history. And after the break, we'll get Mike Parker's take on the Wild Week in Corvallis. It's a great day to be a Beaver. We are committed to winning at Oregon State, and this hire makes a huge statement in that regard. Go Beavs! Garrison picks it up! For the first time since 2007, 
Oregon State will win the Civil War. Unbelievable. It's a great crowd. These kids work their tails off, come back from 10 points down. I love these kids. I love this place. Go Beavers. The Beavers, they need to regroup. They're going to be one and three. Now Luton and the Beavers trying to find a glimmer of something, and that is not what they're looking for. Watson picks it off. Get to the outside, and Luton takes a hit. Certainly is scary to see Jake Luton, any player, laying on the ground after a collision like that. As you are aware, it has been mutually agreed by Gary Anderson uh, that uh, he will step down from his position as a head football coach of Oregon State. I want to thank Gary for the many contributions to the student athletes, OSU athletics, and this great university. Our football program has advanced in many ways during Gary's tenure. Well, it wasn't just Beaver Nation stunned by the news of Gary Anderson's departure midseason. Coaches across the Pac-12 had similar reaction when they learned the news, including Chris Peterson, who learned of it during his weekly press conference. Gary Anderson's leaving Oregon State. I don't know if you heard that or not. What? Yeah, he's, he's out in Corvallis. Uh, they just announced that. Mutual. Um, to be honest with you, I really don't have a thought. I've been locked into Stanford, and I just found out about that coming in here. And um, good football coach. Again, I don't know what's going on there, but I uh, wish him and his family nothing but the best. Yeah, that's that's hard. You know, it's just too bad that, you know, at least you can't finish the season. And, you know, I think it's really, really hard on the kids and, and those type of things. And it seems like things, you know, I always talk about this, you know, the, the patience level gets shorter and shorter as money and all those things keep getting bigger. Everybody has less less tolerance for not getting it done. Time now to bring in a guy who I'm sure was as shocked as anyone, Mike Parker from Corvallis. Mike, you're, you're with these guys day in, day out. I know you've been a big believer in what Gary Anderson was doing down there. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Well, the same reaction that I think we heard from one of the co- What? <laughs> I mean, just completely off guard, uh, completely blindsided by it, uh, really staggered, honestly, by the news. And it's the second time that I've had that kind of feeling about hearing about a coach leaving. Riley, when he left to Nebraska, took me by surprise. This one even more so because Gary Anderson has communicated to me uh, through both the way he speaks uh, on and off the record, a guy that, that's a fighter. And so I'm really surprised that he would look around and, and choose to make this decision at this point. But I think he is doing so for really honorable reasons, and I commend him for that. Well, as, as Chris Peterson said in the, the soundbite we just heard a minute ago, I mean, it's got to be really tough on the players to have their coach leave midseason. A lot of football left to play. How are these guys handling it right now? I think they're handling it well so far after the initial feeling of being stunned, shocked, bewildered, like we've already addressed that many of us have felt. But it is ultimately all about the players. That's partly indeed why I commend Gary because he said he's making this decision in his view to step aside now because of the student athletes and and one of those took time a, a fifth year senior who's been through a lot it's not the first time he's gone through this we had a chance to catch up with Jordan Villeman about it a little up and down here and there you know it's shocking just very shocking just to see it happen but I mean it's a business just just like it happened a couple years ago business and you know you just got to keep pushing forward you mentioned a couple years ago what is that like to have to go through this twice in your college career uh i mean i didn't expect to go through it once you know what i'm saying so i mean twice is pretty you know difficult the first time was difficult the second time is just as difficult so i mean just gotta you know keep pushing keep playing football you know because that's what i was brought here to do you know um, so just keep that's what they want me to do just keep playing football that's it Gary, coach anderson has helped me and my mom through a lot you know i've gone through a lot of personal battles and, you know not a lot of people know about and he's been there in my corner the whole time you know and so he's been just great to me you know he could have you know kicked me out of the program after he, when he first got here just to clean the house but he didn't you know he gave me opportunity you know prove my worth and stuff so I, you know i just have to thank him for that one no still stalking you know i mean i was looking around for coach at practice today i'm not gonna lie it was a little, little tidbit where i was like where is he but you know 
happens. But I mean, you know, everything everything works out for itself. You know, God has a plan, so I'm I'm just waiting to see what happens. Jordan said that if he had an opportunity, and he will, if he could share a message with Coach Anderson, he said it would be one of love. He loves Coach Anderson. Coach Anderson loved his players, and I've talked to a number of other players who had very similar feelings about it. So as shocked as they are, though. Amanda, they've gone back to work together with a lot of enthusiasm and energy moving on, even though it's been a very bewildering kind of week here. So Corey Hall takes over coaching duties for now, but of course a coaching uh, search now begins. Who do you feel like, maybe not who, but what what kind of attributes do they need here? What kind of characteristics? What's the ideal head coach? Yeah, I do think that there's got to be a real connection and feel to what Oregon State and Corvallis is all about. It's a unique and special place. I really felt when Gary Anderson was hired that, that he checked all those boxes in choosing to come to leaving Wisconsin as a sitting head coach to come here and give his best shot at Oregon State. So in that respect, I think you're looking for a guy with integrity and who cares about his players, and Coach Anderson certainly fits that. But uh, there was a maybe a bit of a disconnect in some way. Clearly, things didn't go as Gary had felt. So I'm not sure what Scott Barnes and the committee will be looking for exactly. Here's hoping that by the end of the season, Corey Hall's done so well in rallying and the guys around him that he's in the conversation because he's young, energetic, charismatic, great recruiter, connects with the players, a tremendous personality. So before we talk about the next in 2018, I think guys are rallying around the guy who's the next here to finish out 2017. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Still to come on the show, Lindsay Schnell joining us. She caught up with some of the players to find out if any of them feel like Anderson had quit on the team in an unusual nickname. I gave it to him after practice one day. He just, you know, how he talks and he's going, he plays just like that. He's doing this. He's getting after it. He's telling people what to do. And, and I go, you're the daggum Tasmanian devil. Welcome back to Talking Beavers. More to come on Gary Anderson and replacing him for the Beavers. Then we're going to be handing out our game balls to who we think is going to be the difference maker for Saturday against Colorado. And we're crowning our damn best. Uh, we're working on that bracket. And we're taking a look at the Pac-12 South standings. Corey Hall and the Beavers first test in 0-3 Colorado. The Buffs, the cellar dwellers of the Pac-12 South, just, win, uh, just a year after winning the division. So what is the deal with this Colorado squad? A closer look at the Buffs in our Toyota tune-up. So the Buffs hoping to prove the last season wasn't a fluke, but they have struggled so far this season. Why are you finding that that is the case? Uh, <laughs> uh, look, what it really, yeah, what it really comes down to is one, they were winning games, so they ran into UW. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the Pac-12. Your one of your first Pac-12 game is uh, is the University of Washington. Things don't usually go very well for you. Um, two, they have struggled defensively, and that was always going to be the question. And they looked really good against Colorado State, and they looked really good against Northern Colorado and Texas State. And then they ran into the Pac-12, which is totally different than all those teams offensively. And they've struggled. They gave up 372 yards passing to UCLA. And more importantly, they can't get off the field. 9 of 16 was UCLA on third down. Then they gave up 413 yards rushing to Arizona. Arizona was 6 of 9 on third down. Nine attempts at third down means they're not even getting the third down. They were literally just running the football like that. So that's been their struggle. And so I think the key for the Beavers is, can you continue that run game? Can you continue to hurt them in it and not get to third down and long, which is kind of usually the bane of all offenses' existence? Yeah, let's definitely use the clock to our advantage. Run the ball, run the ball, some play action, you know, just kind of create some mismatches, and I think they'll be all right. But uh, obviously they got a good offense too, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Philip Lindsay, he had a great game against uh, Arizona, 281 yards rushing in that Very one. High. Yeah. As the as the resident running back expert, uh, what is like, yeah. what kind of challenges he pose? I like pose? his style. I like <laughs> his style. Uh, he's a complete back. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure NFL scouts are looking at that and loving that. Um, catch the ball. He catches the ball well, runs the ball well, blocks well, and he's the he's a vocal leader. Um, and, you know, the, the team feeds off of him. Yeah, I mean. he's the swag captain for real yeah. on that team. <laughs> I mean, he's the guy that, he's the littlest dude out there, but has uh -huh. by far the biggest heart, and they follow him. And so he's been the key uh, to their success. And you go back to, once again, average under four yards of carry against the University of Washington, just over four uh, against uh, UCLA, and had a great game. I had a career night against 
uh, Arizona. The problem is Khalil Tate ran for 327 on him. So uh, ultimately, um, if you bottle him up and you can run the football, it'll be a great day for the Beavs. So. Steve Montez kind of lit up this team last year. Uh, and now he's in his first full-time year, full year as the, the full-time starter. What kind of challenge does he pose? He, well, he poses a couple of problems because, one, even if you lock up those wide receivers, and the Blackout boys are for real now. I mean, you got Bobo. You got, I mean, they, they've got so many dudes, Shea Fields. Um, so even if you do lock him up there, I mean, he, threw, he was only 17 to 36 against UCLA for 243. I mean, 243 is not a bad day at the office. But then my man ran 15 attempts for 108 yards. He averaged seven yards a carry against UCLA. So he can hit you, hurt you with his feet, too. He's not necessarily a blazer, but for a guy that size that can move like he can, he's just tough for guys to bring down. So, I mean, he's, he's definitely a two-headed monster. Yeah, he's definitely going to give us some issues. I don't think we face a, a running quarterback like that this year besides, I guess, Portland State's quarterback. All right, still to come, we're announcing the next matchup on our offensive side of our damn best bracket. And up next, Lindsay joins us to discuss the players' reaction to Coach Anderson's departure. Time now for our standard TV and appliance headlines with our veteran reporter, Lindsay Schnell of USA Today. Joining us from NBC Sports Bay Area today down there covering uh, basketball media days for the Pac-12. But Lindsay, of course, it's all about football this week as we talk about Oregon State. What was your reaction to Gary Anderson's news on Monday? Because I know you were down there in Corvallis. Well, I mean, my initial reaction was just, what the heck is going on? I was absolutely stunned. Um, we, I got a tip that something was going to happen uh, about 20 minutes before it did, and I thought that it was going to be that there were some coordinator hires, uh, coordinator changes coming, like maybe with some people getting fired. Instead, we get this news that Gary Anderson has quit. He's resigned. Um, absolutely crazy, Amanda. I still can't really wrap my brain around fully what happened. I think that that's how a lot of people in Corvallis feel. It was a surreal day to run down to Oregon State and see a new football coach. I mean, it wasn't, I remember when Gary was hired, you know, doing a hit with Dwight uh, from Corvallis and suddenly we're in a new era already. Well, I, I know there's a perception out there that he quit on his team, at, you know, doing this mid-season, you know, one that players have kind of largely dismissed. What's your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, let's let's hear more from those players. Uh, like I said, I was in Corvallis on Monday. I talked to Ryan Nall, and I thought he gave a really thoughtful answer when I asked him if he felt like Gary Anderson quit. I don't think he quit. Um, you know, I think... You know, he was put in a difficult situation. I think that, you know, he made the right move for him and his family and, and his situation. Um, you know, if he would have quit, he wouldn't have shown up today. And he wouldn't have had the meeting today. So if he would have quit, um, you know, I, it wouldn't have been what we had today. We would have seen something else differently. He wouldn't have been as emotional. He wouldn't have been as, as bad as it was today. So he did not quit on us. So, like I said, I think that's a really thoughtful answer from Ryan Nall. And, you know, Nall is the type of kid, in my opinion, and it would take a lot for him to lose trust or lose faith in a coach. So I appreciated what he said. I think it came from the heart. I think it was genuine. And I think he's wrong, Amanda. He absolutely quit on his team. I mean, from the day he set foot on Oregon State's campus, Gary Anderson preached toughness and fighting through adversity and finish, 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 like most coaches do. And it was that type of attitude that made everyone think he was the right guy for the job. And then here it is, year three, things are not going as people anticipated, and he just gives up on his team you know i gave athletic director scott barnes every opportunity to say if there was something else going on if something was off with his health if they had a reason to fire him for cause and he resigned before they could do that and barnes emphatically said no to all of that so to me he just walked away from his team i mean that's horrible what type of message are you sending to these 18 to 22 year olds and furthermore this notion that oh he left all this money on the table well amanda if you or i quit our jobs i don't think that we would be paid either he was not going to be fired at the end of the season oregon state was not in a position to do that financially but also just a couple weeks ago barnes had publicly declared we have the right guy in place so I think he absolutely quit. I can't believe it. I talked to some people in the Big Ten who said they weren't surprised because they felt like he was a quitter when he left Wisconsin the way he did. But I'm just 
beside myself. Uh, and, you know, I think that the text messages that John Canzano of the Oregonian printed in a Tuesday column revealed even more that Anderson wasn't really willing to take responsibility. You know, he threw his assistants under the bus a lot in those text messages. And it doesn't quite make sense to me if you're saying you hired the wrong guys and then you're going to walk away and leave these kids in the hands of those wrong guys. How does that add up? Interesting stuff, Lindsay. Uh, obviously, it's very early to start talking about the coaching search, but everybody wants to, to you know, start focusing on who's going to be the next coach of Oregon State. Corey Hall, of course, filling that interim void. What's kind of the latest you're hearing about the search, and what do they need there? So I think the biggest thing is, you know, I've been on record a lot, especially on our shows, talking about how hard it is to win at Oregon State. But you can win there. I do believe that. They should be a bowl team regularly. But you have to find someone that understands the unique challenges of Corvallis. So I think you need to hire someone who has won a tough place before. The two most successful coaches on Oregon State's campus, Pat Casey and Scott Ruick, they did those things, both coming from Division Three, where you have no advantages, you know, and where you're convincing kids to come play for you even though they're probably going to go in debt to do it. So with that in mind, obviously everyone's going to want to talk about Jonathan Smith at UW and I get it, but I will say that I'm not convinced he's ready for this job yet. To be a head coach, you know, is a lot of responsibility and it wasn't that long ago that people were calling for his head up at UW. The person that makes a lot of sense to me too, in fact, are Alex Grinch, the current defensive coordinator at Washington State. He's probably one of the hottest names in the coordinator ranks right now across the country. A lot of people are going to make a run at him. He's had success at Washington State, the place that is most comparable to Corvallis uh, in the Pac-12. And then Bo Baldwin, currently the offensive coordinator at Cal, who of course Oregon State fans remember because talk about a man that can recruit quarterbacks. He did that very, very well in eastern Washington. But two other names I want to throw out there. How about Bronco Mendenhall? He's an Oregon State alum. He's at Virginia right now. He's proven that he can win there, obviously. Proved he could win at BYU before that. I don't know if he wants to come home but I think he's an interesting name and I say this somewhat jokingly but mostly not the George Fox to Corval to Oregon State pipeline has worked really really well what about Chris Casey the brother of Pat Casey the baseball coach Chris Casey won a lot of games as a high school football coach he understands the state as well as anyone and now he's revived a completely dormant program at George Fox they're going to have money to go make a good hire, but I don't think this is about a splashy name. They need to find the right fit. All right, Lindsay, thanks so much. We'll see you back here next week. All right, well, these guys still have a game to prepare for. We're going to be handing out our prediction game balls for Saturday's showdown with Colorado. And up next, who's winning the battle between Nick Barnett and Reggie Tung? We're going to reveal next. Plenty of Oregon State shows coming your way each and every week here at NBC Sports Northwest. Beavers Inside the Heddle airs Thursdays at 9 p.m. Of course, go Beavs Friday nights at 9 to get you ready for the game. And Talking Beavers Tuesday at 7 p.m. coming up this week. Uh, I want to bring up the notion of Gary Anderson being a quitter. Obviously, Lindsay had some very strong thoughts, as she does every week here. Uh, but that's been an idea that's been passed around a lot. Why the middle of the season? If you are doing it for the kids, is he a quitter? What are your thoughts on that, that notion? Yeah, I mean, she said a lot there, so I'm not even sure how to piecemeal all of it. Look, I'll start with the whole idea that old Big Ten coaches said he was a quitter at Wisconsin. First of all, you work with Barry Alvarez, so start with that. Um, and he took that team to a Big Ten championship. So to say that he quit when he left, I think he was just looking for a different situation. Uh, and there's a reason that I think those people wouldn't want to put their names on those comments. Second of all, you know, she brought up some tweets, or excuse me, some texts that were sent and published in an article, and obviously some of the language I can't repeat, but I took those completely differently. Like, if I was a parent, I, the first one was on September 1st. I love my kids, just want them to take a step. Don't expect greatness, but I want to see progress. Getting old, patience isn't what it used to be. He goes on on September 3rd, if the defense can't get better, I'll be making some decisions I really don't like or want to make. We will grind. Uh, there was a, uh, the thing, self-promoting on September 4th. That's what this business has become. The biggest reason I'm not going to be in this for long is because kids are a second thought or a third or a fourth. So for me, that tells me that his number one priority was about the kids. Mm -hmm. It was always about the kids. And these were private conversations I don't believe he thought were ever going to get published a month later. And then you go into the fact that, you know, uh, I think she brought up the idea that somehow he didn't take responsibility. He said, I hired the wrong guys and are still working our way through a bunch of years, that, uh, recruiting years that stunk. It's year three. If we can't get it right, 
I, I will not say just fire them and start over. It's not the way to go about it. If I bleeped it up that bad, I will take the bullet and write off in the sunset. If that's not a premonition of what actually happened, that's what he said, that ultimately it would stop with him. And if that, to me, is re taking responsibility and writing off in the sunset, that's basically what he did, Ev. Yeah, I think, you know, with Coach Anderson, he was always up front. He told you, you know, you, you got what you, what you saw is what you got. Right. You know, he never hit anything. Um, obviously, the players loved him. You see Ryan Nall, you know, tearing up a little bit, choking up, and Villeman talking about it a little bit, too. How about Scott Barnes choking yeah, up? Yeah, cho even, I mean, that's... But they go way back. Yeah, they go Inter way back. They're Tosti. brothers. And obviously, there's love between those guys. Um, and it wasn't an easy decision. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I picked up, too, when, you know, Ryan Nall talked about getting the opportunity. We, when I was a GA there three years ago with Coach Ryan's staff, we didn't know what to do with Ryan Nall. We were like, is he a linebacker? Is he a tight end? Or what is he? And so for Coach Anderson to come in and have faith in Ryan, be like, Ryan, you're going to be our guy. You're going to play running back. Um, it, it just shows like the, the Coach Anderson loved those players. Um, and, you know, obviously those, those text messages, those tweets, whatever you want to call them, between him and Cazano, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, but maybe you don't kind of <laughs> text that guy, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I think she, also she brought up the idea of maybe going about hiring somebody um, oh. Taking the case of like women's basketball or baseball hiring a Division three guy. Here's the problem with that. Division one football, especially in the Pac-12 conference, is not like women's basketball or baseball. Yeah. Okay, there's a reason the stadium has 45,000 people and the other people's <laughs> stadium got 3,000. Okay, because Division one football pushes the it drives the NCAA as a whole. People did conference realignment not because of basketball, men's or women's or baseball. They did it because of football. Football is the cash cow. Yeah. That's why people spend so much money mm -hmm. for season tickets. People spend coaches. so much money on coaches <laughs> and facilities because it's the it is the driver of the entire uh, athletic department. So. If you're going to give the keys to somebody, you have to give the keys to somebody you know will be successful right. and you know will drive people to the gates and you know will drive donors to open up their pocketbooks. Right. And that's why I go back to what has been your previous uh, formula for success? Was it the Jerry Pettibones? Was it the, the Division Three guy? Like, no, that's, that's never... What's worked is the guy who has an NFL pedigree because ultimately the thing that drives kids to Corvallis versus being in Berkeley you, you're not able to sell, at Cal you can sell a world-class education. I mean, number one public school in the world. You can't do that at OSU. In LA, you can sell LA. In Seattle, you can sell Seattle. You can't do that to an 18-year-old kid in LA. But if you can sell to me, I have a chance to go to the NFL, I can be in a family atmosphere, and we can win football games because this guy has proved it in the past at the elite level, that will get me to look in Corvallis. Right. Man, yeah. we, could, we could talk this all day. <laughs> but obviously there's a game this week. We're going to hand out our Wilson Motor Game Balls, which we're hoping is who we're hoping to see to have a breakout game this week. Uh, Nigel, who, who do you think is going to have a breakout game? I got the dude, man, Seth Collins. Uh, they finally got him the ball and fed the, fed the rock to the guy who's explosive, can make things happen. So uh, hopefully they learn from that and continue to, uh, to feed the ball to the guy who can make a bunch of somethings out of a lot of nothings. Evanson, who are you Coach Hall. Coach Hall, baby. I think... Uh, <laughs> Um, for him, just getting that team A lot of pressure excited. on him, right? Yeah, was a lot of pressure. Uh, first time, you know, at the head coaching spot in the, in the college level. So I think it's, uh, it's exciting. I think the players are going to be excited to uh, play for him. Uh, and so I think just the way he uh, gets those guys up is going to be, you know, th the way to win. Wait a minute, we can choose coaches? Yeah, we can choose coaches. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a flag. You know, this, I'm pretty this sure that situation. Well, that's cheating. <laughs> you said who gets the game ball. Like, I'm assuming, like, a dude I'm, on the field. I'm pretty sure Coach Hall that's wants hard. to suit up, exactly. too. Exactly. I'm pretty sure he then wants he, to Then up. he wins. All right. <laughs> the game against Colorado. Evanson's getting you ready for the game at the OSU Beaver Star. Cheater. Here we're at the OSU Beaver Store on campus. I have this awesome rain jacket from Columbia. Keeps the rain off here. Obviously, you know with the fall weather, it's gonna be raining a lot. So you gotta stay nice and dry at the football games. And then we have the nice Omni Heat jacket right here for the ladies. The awesome new technology from Columbia. Keeps the heat in, lightweight, don't have to put too much material on. Get all your gear more at the OSU Beaver Store. Fans start here. Well, we're looking to crown the top performance in Oregon State football history in our damn best bracket brought to you by Comcast Business Class built for performance. We unveiled the winner of the first offensive matchup that was Brandon Cooks. Now time for the defensive showdown of Nick Barnett and Reggie Tung. Who's it going to be? You voted and 
Nick Barnett is your winner. 64% of the votes. So on to this week's offensive matchup, and it is Ken Simonton versus the Rogers brothers. We couldn't <laughs> choose because they said that, again, quiz wouldn't really come if James had not been there first. So who is your pick? Who should people be voting for? I'm going to go with Ken, but, you know, obviously okay. the Rogers brothers, those are my boys. Um, love those guys to death, but um, I got to go with Ken. I think he kind of started that. You know, that, that, that winning tradition at Oregon State, the Fiesta Bowl team, um, obviously number one when it comes to yards at Oregon State. Um, I, I think, I'm not sure where he is in the Pac-12. I think it's pretty high, actually. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Ken was the man. I think Ken changes the, the face of the program. Okay. Two things. One, since, um, one, I don't think Ken Simonton appreciates that picture of him <laughs> being, like, 38 years like old. And the other two guys are, like, their shoulder. player profiles. I'm very sure Ken would be upset, upset about that picture. Apparently, it's his Twitter bio. Two, so two, okay. since, since, since Everson cheated earlier in his game ball and picked a coach, I'm going to cheat because if you get to pick two dudes, it's two versus one. Oh, okay. Two have got to beat one. Okay. That's cheating. Okay. So I'm taking the Evanston Bernard. I'm Bernardinist. <laughs> All right. Well, remember that you can vote on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash NBCS Northwest. We're going to be doing this every week throughout the rest of the season. And real quick, Evanston, you had a couple of other thoughts on yeah. the whole Gary Anderson leaving. And, and uh, it's not even about that. It's about Corvallis. You know, I hear, you know, people talk about how Oregon State is not, Corvallis is not a destination place. Um, it is obviously the best college town in the Pac-12. We've, <laughs> we have, we have proof of that. And obviously, uh, you know, when you come to Oregon State, it's a, it's a family. And I don't think a lot of schools in the Pac-12 can really offer that. Um, so, yeah. So, any head coaches out there? Coach Nigel <laughs> is available as, as well. I think, but, yeah. you, I think you need to end this with a go B. I'm a media guy. Go B, baby. Of Gary All right, thanks so much. We'll see you back here on Friday.